All right, welcome to the October webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome um Orkin Umerhan to our webinar, who will share with us the New Horizons missions ex and explorations beyond Pluto. Dr. Orkin Umerhan's research focuses on evolutionary processes, both on planetary surfaces and in protoplanetary disks. He joined the New Horizons Geology and Geophysics investigation team way back in 2013 and did a lot of the mathematical modeling for uh, the flyby through the Pluto system. He regularly writes blog posts uh, for NASA about New Horizons, and recently he's uh, started to do some work with the SETI Institute as well as some other organizations. And so without further ado, please welcome Orkin Umerhan. Okay, let's see here. So I am now sharing my, there we go. Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm glad everyone is here to uh, listen to me talk about uh, our flyby of uh, MU69. And uh, so I will uh, just get right into it. So uh, we, um, we went through a very exciting time in the last uh, year uh, with New Horizons. As you know, New Horizons uh, is continued out, uh, out of the solar system and uh, just recently has uh, passing through what's known as the Kuiper Belt. And of course, this was something that we've been planning for for many years. And so I want to tell you about what we saw uh, on January 1st, 2019. And why it is so important uh, what we saw in terms of getting insights into the origins of the solar system, which for me it's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, experience because it started. It's basically has folded in many of the work that I used to do long before I became a geologist because I originally work on uh, questions of uh, the formation of the solar system, and this body and bodies like it in the, what's called the cold Kuiper belt, which I'll talk about some more, um, uh, is one of the first keys, uh, bits of evidence that uh, are, will help us constrain narrative we have about how the first planetesimals formed, which ultimately lead to the first planets. So without further ado, uh, do a little bit of a review of the, uh, of New Horizons itself. And uh, so, as you know, in, uh, on January 19th of 2006, New Horizons was launched on an Atlas V rocket, and it was the fastest rocket uh, flight ever. And that's because there was basically nothing on top of it except for a very itty bitty bitty little thing called the New Horizons spacecraft. And of course, the speed was necessary to get us to uh, out to the Kuiper Belt uh, long before all of us die. <laughs> so, I mean, if you know what I mean, it takes a long time to go out for out to 40, uh, 39 astronomical units or even further out. So, you know, there was a lot of decisions made about what kind of payload to put on. And so, let me just quick reminder: uh, New Horizons, the payload itself is the size of a, a little grand piano, and it has uh, several. Uh, in, uh, cameras and instruments on there. The ones that are of importance for us uh, is the uh, long range reconnaissance imager. Uh, basically, the nice uh, 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 10 inch uh, um, uh, black and white camera, and what we call LORI. And together with it, we had a couple of, couple of uh, color cameras uh, one called MVIC and the other one called LISA. LISA is important because it allows us to. To develop uh, uh, to extract spectra um, on a 256 by 256 grid, which is very important, obviously, for understanding what stuff we're looking at is made of. So, uh, and uh, and of course, there are other instruments as well. A uh, thing called the the Ralph. I mean, Ralph is actually the combination of Envic and Lisa. And then there's the Alice instrument, which is an ultraviolet detector, which didn't really play a role um, in the mission. Uh, that we just had, but played an important role in the Pluto mission, uh, the pluto Charon flyby. There's the REX instrument, which is a radio antenna, and that's actually kind of an important one as well, and you see it all folds in. And uh, a couple of other instruments in, uh, involving the measurement of dust particles uh, in the, um, 
uh, and uh, cosmic ray particles in the in the system itself. So as you know, in 2006, the, the launch occurred, and uh, it did a quick flyby of the Jupiter satellite gravity assist. And then the, uh, here in this artist's rendition, uh, the red trajectory uh, set it towards an encounter with the Pluto system in July 2015. And it was a very exciting time and quite revolutionary. And we are still trying to make sense of the, uh, the data that we acquired from that uh, even to this day. And it's probably a lifetime of work. Uh, but that's a story for another time. Maybe I'll come back another day and give you a little follow up on what we discovered about Pluto because uh, lots of new things have been, uh, lots of new things have had light shed on it because of this mission. And so it's a developing story. But nonetheless, of course, we had planned the spacecraft to continue on its way out of the solar system. And, uh, but it was right prior to the encounter with uh, Pluto that we actually discovered this object that was kind of in the trajectory uh, of the spacecraft as it is. And so I'll get to that in a moment. But just as a quick little reminder, the Pluto system, as is written here, seen through the eyes of New Horizons. And uh, of course, there was the, the, this ice planet. I don't call it a dwarf planet. I'm, I am a partisan, I guess, in these matters. Uh, it, it barks like a planet. It acts like a planet. It's got all the signs of a planet, and for my purpose, it's a planet. And it, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a binary pair uh, component, Charon. And one of the things I'd like to point out to people, one of the things that people kind of get, uh, it's hard to get their heads around, the pluto Charon system is really that. It's a double planet system. And we don't have examples of that anywhere in the solar system. And as far as we are concerned, as, well, as far as we know, other exoplanet systems have not yet been discovered to be a double planet system. So this is one of these, also such a beautifully unique system in and of its own right, that it's literally uh, bodies that are of comparable size, uh, eighth the size of Pluto. But by comparison to the other four uh, little critters orbit around it, uh, it's basically, uh, uh, you know, it's the, it's, it's the dominant folks in town with a bunch of uh, stragglers kind of held behind. Now, where did these guys come from? Probably something having to do with the remnants of this uh, formation of the system itself. Of course, this is a lot of ongoing uh, science, scientific speculation, as well as um, inquiry and uh, analysis as well. So, as you know, in science, as we know, always know that people come up with a speculation about something or another, and uh, we try to see if the data fits the story, and if not, then you have to change the story until it starts making sense of the data that you see. So it's an ongoing story, and actually it's very exciting. Uh, so I noticed, a, or can I, um, I noticed something on the one slide a couple of slides back, and I noticed that the orientation that you had there seemed to show that Pluto was fairly close to the node at which the um, two planes, the Pluto's uh, orbital plane and the ecliptic plane are pretty much co coincident there. And so was that known, you know, specifically? Yeah. And so had there been delays on the, on the mission, what would that well, have the, done? The, the mission was designed in light of the possibility of us continuing on to the Kuiper Belt. And we knew that, of course, the, and I'll show you a little bit later, Kuiper Belt objects span the full uh, spectrum of uh, inclinations. But we all had our eyes on the cold classical Kuiper Belt. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and so it, everything kind of put together. And there was a little bit of serendipity also in the local of um, where Pluto was going to be in terms of being close to the ecliptic plane. Uh, but uh, that actually part of the planning and how we try, we try to maximize all the possibilities. So uh, by the way, you know, a good book to read uh, is Alan Stern's book, uh, Chasing New Horizons and uh, Dale Cruikshank's book came out recently. And there's a nice write up about it in the, um, the, the New York Review of Books, I'm sure you all uh, have, some of you probably heard of it. It's out in this, uh, there's a nice review of the two books itself, but Chasing New Horizons in particular is a very gripping story. So uh, I'm not paid to plug it, 
but it's a good book. I highly recommend it. Uh, right. So, so if I shall carry on. So he got highlights of the flute of Clivey, and uh, they're, they're, you know, it's just it's an amazing place. We saw examples of uh, nitrogen ice glaciers, nitrogen ice flows, uh, things called the bladed terrain. Uh, this uh, example of the fact that the two plant, uh, the two bodies, starkly different in terms of um, one is basically geologically active, the other one is not, and they're all kind of abutted next to each other. The, the, the brightness contrast is also another very real thing that comes up with the, that's a consequence of the things we've uh, discovered. Um, we see examples of, uh, uh, here on this panel here, you see all kinds of different types, mineral, I mean, uh, molecules that are frozen onto the surface and their distribution different from one another. You have methane, you have nitrogen, you have carbon monoxide, and then you have water, and their distribution on the surface is very different, and it tells you something about the thermal climate on the surface and its interaction with the atmosphere. And um, it has really opened up this, uh, in, in a very stark way, the study of ice bodies and the natural climates and the natural uh, uh, thermal physical and uh, ecological conditions that these places provide. And one of the things I just want to point before I get into the good stuff uh, of, our, of our recent encounter is that, uh, and I had pointed this out before, these cold bodies, which sit at about 50 Kelvin, 40 Kelvin, 50 Kelvin, given the kinds of uh, what we call volatile materials like methane and like nitrogen and CO, that temperature and the, the conditions that are, are, are present on the surface are one make them be near their triple points. And the triple one where uh, it doesn't take very much to turn one body from a solid into a gas or into a liquid. And only a couple of places in the solar system that have this example. Obviously, one of them is Earth because Earth's uh, surface is... Uh, has a lot of water, and water can exist in three phases. And Mars uh, kind of gets close to it, not quite, but you can get Mars uh, uh, existing uh, near its triple point for CO2 as an example. But on, meth on Pluto, you've got both nitrogen and uh, carbon monoxide sitting close to their triple points. And so it leads to very interesting geological features. So I I, I always love talking about that because that always captures my imagination about what's going on. But let's get to the star of the show. So as we were getting ready to do, uh, uh, getting ready for our encounter, we had several what are called operation readiness tests, ORTs. And an ORT is essentially a, a time when we all get together and we practice uh, how we're going to actually behave. <laughs> how we're going to do the science, what kinds of questions we're going to ask, and so on and so forth, when the day of closest encounter comes. So it was during one of our ORT tests that one of our team members came with this discovery. And this discovery, and I'm showing you over here, was the discovery of this body. And you can see it there kind of streaming by in the green uh, that is essentially on track with Pluto's traje uh, with New Horizons trajectory past Pluto. So it was very exciting and it became called uh, uh, 2014 MU69, which was later called Ultima Thule. And it, to us, this was, I think this was in September 2014. So this approximately nine months before our actually closest encounter that we found that this body was on its path. Now, I make it sound easy. It wasn't easy. We had to use Hubble Space Telescope uh, time to actually uh, a dedicated time to actually scan that part of the Kuiper Belt to see if there was anything there. And we pleaded and we begged and we asked the the, the, the director of Hubble itself for uh, his discretionary time, and he gave it to us. And we used that, and we got really. In fact, we found this, and we found one other along the way. And so we had a choice, uh, but it turned out this one was uh, required less of fuel usage to get to. 
So we discovered this, the proposals were made, and then we declared there to be a follow-up mission after Pluto. We decided we were going to come after this object. So this is, the, this is a beautiful little story, and I'll try to summarize it as best I can. Uh, we have uh, a, a fellow on our team. Uh, he's, at the, he's at the Lowell Observatory. His name is Mark Buey. And he set out on doing what's called a ground-based uh, occultation campaign. Since we knew where the body was and what its trajectory was based on those previous images, we went out and tried to, basically we, they, they organized this team involving a bunch of amateur astronomers uh, to go out to various sites on the, on, on the, on the planet uh, at designated times. And what we were gonna do, we were aiming towards trying to catch ultimately pass in front of some background star. And as you can see here on the left, you can see there's some background star just kind of hanging. And then you see it kind of blink in and out again. So this is, this is the principle. And we were, what the plan was is to catch MU69 actually doing this to one or two or several other uh, uh, bodies, uh, uh, stars, in, in the course of the next few months. Doing an occultation measurement can tell you a lot. And one of the things that we learned from the very early occultation measurements that the body itself was actually kind of low bait and lumpy in some weird looking way. We had some estimates that maybe it was about 30 to 40 kilometers in length. But what you see here is this little picket fence sort of pattern. And the picket fence pattern tells you, and what is this picket fence re pattern representing? What it's representing is observatories on the ground. And what were those observatories? They were individual teams of two taking out 12-inch celestrons out to places in Africa, in South Africa, and in um, Ghana, and in um, South America, because there were these various sites where actually kind of catch it in occultation. And they were set up about uh, 10 to 15 kilometers separated each other in latitude. So the idea is we will catch this thing, make a shadow on this object, but we don't know where that shadow is going to fall. But if we have enough coverage, as you can see with these white, basically this like white picket fence sort of trajectory, then we might be able to not only catch it, but we might be able to say something about what it's shaped like. So this was done on, uh, it was a quite an expensive operation. It cost about a million dollars, but it was a proof of concept that showed that astronomers could get involved with directly making measurements at, uh, of the shape and, and, and quality of the smallest objects in our solar system that are uh, sort of gravitationally bound. Or so, can, did you guys do this through IOTA? Is that the group you worked with, or did you work with a different group? No, we. It was. Uh, it was a group that Mark Buey put together. He had a call to several of the uh, amateur astronomy organizations in the individual countries that were involved, and so they brought out and and so a bunch of. People came out in support, and we provided the telescopes about them. So since we didn't know a, a priori how big this object really was, we just know it's possibly going to blink this thing up. Big it is. You can imagine the shadow. It's like a, a shadow of an airplane passing over the ground, right? If you're in the right place, you'll see the, sh uh, the sun be blocked out. Otherwise, you won't, right? So we have to get about 20 uh, telescopes out there. We provided the telescopes. And they provided a lot of the amateur astronomers in location to help us with the project, which is pretty cool about it. It's just like, uh, it's a big, like, you know, uh, sort of collective activity. And so we saw this, and I will return to this in a minute, in, well, a minute, in about like maybe 15 minutes. Uh, but this is what we, um, we predicted that this is what it's going to be. Personally, ask me, I was like, now, these guys must something wrong. I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. I was kind of a doubter, but I'm a scientist. I'm paid to be a doubter. 
it was okay. So let's carry on. Little bit of background, and I'll whip through some of these slides very quickly. New Horizons was set to enter into the region called the Cold Classical. Now, what is the Cold Classical Kuiper Belt? Cold Classical Kuiper Belt is this location out in the solar system, out between about 40 to about 48, 49 astronomical units. And it's known to, and, and it was, had been theorized to hold particle uh, uh, planetesimals or small bodies, oh, Kuiper itself, many years ago. And it remained sort of a theoretical sort of prediction, but it was, had not been actually observed to actually hold any significant number of bodies until only the early 2000s. So which is part of the reason why this is so exciting. Now the cold Kuiper belt is consists of what's called the cold Kuiper belt. There's the hot Kuiper belt object. And what I'm plotting here is a plot of the number of bodies as a function of radius and the vertical axis is, is, is its uh, inclination back to the, uh, uh, the, the uh, ecliptic. So these are, these are bodies that like Pluto sit at really high angle uh, uh, or high inclined orbits. So there's the high classical and the cold classical. The cold classicals tend to lurk down towards the, I mean, there's some spread, but there is clearly a, uh, a, a different population. There's also a little difference in their colors and so on, but I won't get into that detail uh, necessarily. Now, I just want to point out two other things. There is a there, there's a group of bodies that includes Pluto. They're called the Plutinos, little Plutos, okay? And little Plutos, they uh, sit at the three to two orbital resonance between uh, uh, Neptune and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, I'm, and I'm, my, my brain is, uh, uh, basically it's a three two orbital resonance between uh, Neptune and that location in, the, uh, in terms of its Keplerian orbit. And what that does is it, it kicks the orbits because it's in resonance and it causes things to either pile up and float up. Basically, they flare out. And it's an orbital dynamic sort of phenomenon. Anyways, these particle populations here, there are other similar types of populations called, for instance, the centaurs. And they, they are associated with the Jupiter system and, uh, and the Saturnian system as well. Anyway, so it just kind of gives you a picture of the kinds of uh, uh, this dis distribution of particles out in the sources. We were headed towards these, and why is this important? And I'll tell you real quick. This is important from the standpoint of formation in the, in the following sense. The, the stuff that sits here in this region is not excited by these orbital resonances. So these, bo these bodies hold the best promise for some kind of deep insight towards what the conditions were at the formation of the solar system. Because if you think about it, all of the bodies in the solar system have been cooked, have been processed, have been smashed up, it's been churned up, it's been regurgitated, you know, all kinds of things have been going on based on just the evolution of the system itself. But these bodies appear to be the best candidates for bits and bobs left over from when the solar system itself was formed four and a half billion years ago. And these bodies, hopefully, and we expect them to give us more information about giving us insights into the actual formation of bodies themselves. They're almost like the terror, uh, uh, almost like the Holy Grail, you might want to, uh, if you want to kind of throw that kind of thing out there. So, let me pause here. If there are any questions, maybe I should take them because now I'm going to rip through all of our pictures and then. Yeah, this would be a great time to uh, have some comments or questions from all of you. And uh, while we're waiting, I think that this idea of uh, orbital resonances is really interesting. And I'd love to know more about why it is that the lack of um, the resonance with uh, Neptune or whatever they're in resonance with is an important um, why that's important. So, yeah, so the, the, I mean, it's important that if there, there, what we have to understand is that the bodies like the Plutinos, these may have been pushed here into these orbits 
Because what happens when, when you get into this resonance, you stay locked. You get excited, but you get locked in this zone, which is why you see so many bodies kind of floating around here. Uh, these bodies may or may not have been formed at this location. Let's say, for instance, at, I don't know, let's say it's 39 and a half AU, the location of where Pluto is. They may or may not have been formed there, but they get actually drift and get locked into this position because of the orbital resonance itself. Okay? Uh, so these bodies, on the other hand, which don't have a very strong orbital resonance associated with it, are likely to be bodies that were formed in, in situ and didn't actually um, drift from any other place. So as a control, if we want to know what things were made of, you want to go to a place where there's not a lot of processing going on, and you want to be able to say for sure that this hasn't been, uh, the bodies here didn't come from anywhere else. Okay, we did end up with a, yeah, we did end up with another question here. And so uh, we have a question is uh, Sedna, and I guess, um, perhaps some of the other um, objects that are out there, are those a cold or a hot origination body? Where would yeah, that form? Yeah, well, like how does a Sedna form? <laughs> I'm laughing because I was just at a meeting three weeks ago where guys are going to get into fist fights over this question. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that the that, that, that Sedna is such a freak object uh, in the sense of, it shouldn't even be there, but it is. <laughs> what led to it being formed in situ the way that it is and stuff, there's a number of issues that are at play. It's not clear, but this effect has some role in it somehow, but it, that we're still trying to parse the, um, the chronology of that type of story. And of course, the story of Planet 9, which is really should be Planet 10, the mystery planet that's way out in the deep, 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 deep uh, Oort cloud itself, or approaching the Oort cloud itself, and the stuff that uh, Constantine Batijan, for instance, at Caltech has been working on with Mike Brown. Uh, the, the fact that we see all these bodies out there, like nobody knows how they're made. So, but there are a lot of theories. I would love to get into it some more, but I great i may run out of time so. yeah well we probably will but that's okay so chris noticed and and in looking at this like he he says that he notices that um the cold classicals seem to be following a trend towards the northeast and what would make these cold classicals compared to the lighter blue dots that are in the same place right so um we do the cold classicals have a particular uh color thing that's associated with them that are distinct from what are hot classicals. This perhaps, this diagram is, doesn't really uh, do it a lot of ser service to distinguish between the two, but uh, we know that the, this, this color coding that's associated with the cold classicals tend to show them to be closer towards the ecliptic, while the hot classicals, they show that their mean sort of drifts up in the of course, when there's a little bit of mixing and no story is ever clean, so, right? <laughs> I didn't steal the cookie from the cookie jar. It was really something else that happened. You know, it's that kind of story. There's a lot of nuances that might have gotten, but we do see that there's a distinction. There are two different populations and their means tend to show uh, different uh, locations in terms of their inclination. So, but beyond that, it's uh, currently under scientific debate. All right. Uh, okay, so um, so this is just another nice little picture, uh, kind of giving a sense of you know, our artist diagram. When we decided, we made the plans, and that given everything that uh, M69 was going to be our target, and that um, it uh, flyby would be on January 19th and uh, January 1st, 2019. And um, I don't know if anybody out there are fans of uh, certain science fiction uh, stories, and now it's been made into a a, a, a thing. Uh, a, a, I think suddenly all of us here on Pluto, <laughs> all of us, all of us Pluto guys, suddenly became belters, and we are very proud of it. We are 
we own the Kuiper belt and we and 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 we have become so enraptured by the mystery uh, and this, the answers that it might hold that uh, it, so almost overnight when we when decided when NASA approved uh, of us going there or you know basically NASA management said okay go ahead uh, we overnight became a very proud uh, outlanders as it were so I just kind of thought that people might like that and I'm uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan. So, <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's talk about the flyby. So, uh, Ultima Thule is a very challenging flyby because the target is about a hundred times smaller than Pluto was. Uh, even though we are um, we're going to fly closer to it than we ever did to Pluto, it requires navigational precision that had never been done before. Um, on top of that, know how far away that this I mean where exactly this target was located. So we were dealing with a lot of uncertainties in terms of like, you know, what is this thing and where is it located and how we're going to point the cameras. So that's another big challenge because we, we're flying blind. And so we have to come up with a strategy to be able to scan to make sure we catch it. So, you know, you could be lucky or you could be horribly unlucky. One of those things. Uh, we don't know what the environment is like. We don't know if there's debris out there. We could, you know, going at 13 kilometers a second. You know, something the size of, uh, you know, a skin flake could cause major problems on a camera if you smack it into it that, at that at that speed. The other problem is that the body is very, very dark. And, um, and of course, we had other issues in terms of power management between when we saw Pluto and now we've eaten up a lot of battery power. So let's talk a little bit about optical navigation. So uh, here we have, so we had a team of guys. Um, and, and ladies, I mean, uh, just saying the generic, you know, humans, right? Uh, manning the stations and taking images of, of, of approach, you know, months and months out before. And the whole aim is to make sure that we have other objects along the way, so make sure we don't hit it, hit them, and, uh, and to also get a better sense of where the body is located. So on the left here, you have a raw image, on the right, in the middle, you have a processed image, and on the right, you have the, uh, this, the, 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 what's known about the background subtracted and boom. And you can see here with the red bits that the shows the location of, um, of uh, 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 MU-69 sort of drifting across the screen. Keep in mind, people are wondering, why is it drifting? Because we kept the star field fixed in the background and we're watching of the body itself because the body is moving with respect to the background stars. That's how we found it in the first place. Um, I was uh, directly involved with putting together the uh, uh, the uh, trajectory sequence itself. Uh, I mean, obviously it was me and about uh, 15, 14, 15 of us or others. And we had to, we had to vie between uh, battling factions between uh, the guys who are geologists and the composition guys and so on. Okay, we're, we're all, we actually get along together, as you can imagine. The point is, is to sequence our observation in a way to get the maximal science return. So you can imagine sitting down and getting a bunch of opinionated scientists together to agree on something. It's a, it's a process that requires good management. And luckily, we have a lot of very, very good people who knew how to take everyone's input and turn it into something that everyone was happy about. If only our politics in this country were similar. But of course, one could only wish. So anyways, you get the idea that um, this is the white shows the trajectory sequence. Uh, each little tick mark here represents a 15 minute uh, uh, sequence. So you can imagine the whole, everything we're gonna do is, is to a three hour sort of section in total, which is pretty gnarly when you think about it. You gotta be dialed. Everything has gotta be dialed to the point where uh, there's, there's no room for error and you, you, you so this, Horse trading and there's a lot of worrying. This is what we're paid to do. We're paid to worry, and we're good at worrying and keeping our heads straight at the same time. So that's kind of essentially what the sequence plan was. So on approach, closest approach is around here, but we had to make sure that our best color images were taken at certain points. Give we had to maximize the way the sun is striking the surface and so on. You can imagine. So in terms of sort of a, a, a more of a perspective view. You can see that we have a New Horizons passing across 
imagine it's the United States and you're, on, you're passing across like uh, along the Eastern seaboard and the Atlantic and the Ultima Thule is clear, clearly across the, uh, the, si uh, the expanse of the United States. So, and remember, we're looking at a body at that distance, which is about approximately 20 to 40 in size. We still weren't sure how big this thing would be. So it's, you know, it's, that's not trivial. You have to be able to point very carefully with some great, oh yeah, you see, so there it pops up. You can see the, of course, this is obviously not necessarily, oh, well, this is actually probably about half the size, but it gives you a, si a sense of the, of the realistic thing. Oh, this was a nice little thing. Somebody somewhere who was uh, enamored by our project uh, sent this uh, post to uh, uh, Alan Stern. This was about a f about two months before. Now that was quite beautiful, artistically done. Uh, and it was sort of a New Year's, New Horizons type of thing, and it was pretty cool. So we had this floating, we had this up in the, all over during a during our mission control uh, activities, it was like all over the place and where we were at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Anyways, I thought that was kind of cool. And by the way, I'm happy to make these slides available to you all so we can talk about that. Okay, so as we're coming in, so images of Ultima Thule. So this is, this is literally, okay, this is literally about, uh, I don't know, I would say 36 hours before closest approach, maybe a little less. So on the left image, the body now with the cameras on board was resolving something that was about, I don't know, you see how many pixels that is, you know, eight pixels across. So of course, you know, we're like, oh, what is this thing, right? And then we go through this process of image processing, deconvolution, and all this black magic that uh, our friends like Todd Lauer does over at NOAO. And, uh, and so we knew that, well, it looks pretty elongate. Uh, oh yeah, it says here, 37 hours before closest approach. So at this point, the range to Ultima Tula is about uh, 1 million miles or so. Next day, almost 24 hours later, this is what it looks like. You see the actual images, themselves, the pixels themselves. This is a processed image. So this is now, uh, we, we were get a good sense that this thing is about 20, uh, about 35 kilometers, mas o menos. And so we were like, all right, well, I guess they were right. It's probably by low bait. And that's when I had to pay my dollar to my friend, Oliver White, because I bet him, I was like, oh, there must be wrong. So I was wrong. So happily. <laughs> so, um, and then, and this was the morning of uh, January 1st. It was like about three or four a.m. when this image came down. And of course we were like, ah, when's it coming? <laughs> no, no, actually it's more. Or it was uh, early mid morning when, when we actually got the the downlink from the uh, the image uh, from the uh, New Horizon itself. So it looks like this, not very impressive, but it blew our minds. You can see, it looked like a snowman. Like we were jokingly calling it the snowman. Uh, so it's interesting what uh, difference a day makes. Uh, this was the moment. This was the actual moment where um, uh, we. The image downloaded on my, uh, and I was actually, my, my, my chair um, where I was working was right next to him. So I got up, jumped around over there, and that was the image, that was when he, my friend Stuart Robbins, he's a crater counter, master crater counter of the world. He was like, oh my God, it's here, it's here, it's here. So we all jumped in and this nice photo was taken. And as you can see, there was some leftover action from the night before. And um, this is, the best view of Ultima Thule, this is the image that came down a couple weeks later. And the reason for that is we had to, uh, uh, our first images had to come down uh, in um, JPEG compression, but uh, because it takes so much time to download all that data. And this is the image that came down uh, about, about two weeks later. So I'm, we're kind of cheating here a little bit. I'm showing you um, what it actually looks like based on the high resolution images. This was the actual image of the body at seven minutes before closest approach. And you can tell we were looking at something that we had never seen before. We had never even imagined we would see anything like this before. And it, uh, it, it uh, really confounded all of us and it continues to confound. Uh, there are many things I wanna point out and I think this would be a good time for me 
uh, take a pause and take some questions, move on. And I do want to mention that uh, we're uh, at a quarter to seven and uh, we are not going to have a uh, traditional Q&A at the very end. And so if you have any questions or comments, uh, now would be a good time. And I can, by the way, I can, I can try to speed this up, go through the rest of this in the next 10 minutes. I'm sorry I waxed too much on this. But no, we're good. Story. Fabulous. <laughs> um, how, why is it, what's the naming? What is Ultima Tool and why don't you pronounce oh, that? Oh, gosh, that's a hard one, yeah. Um, so the, 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 uh, the metaphor, the, the comes from, it's a historically based thing from the days of the Romans where Ultima Thule was supposed to be the, uh, represent the furthest northern outpost or the furthest northern extent. And it was supposed to represent uh, from, uh, uh, from the vantage point of um, the Norse tribes as well, but as, as well as the Romans, this perspective of pushing the boundaries and going towards new horizons, right? That's, that's kind of like the theme. And, um, and so, that the that was the tentative name given to it, and that was uh, you know based on some NASA management decisions, including people like Alan Stern and so forth. Uh, but unfortunately, as some people know, that there's uh, very negative uh, connotations related to Ultima Thule and things uh, having to do with uh, uh, Nazi race ideology. And I can assure you, there was no such connection here. And uh, that, although it was an unfortunate thing that people decided to uh, put their finger on this and say, oh, this has got something to do, and that has nothing to do with that. I mean, yeah, you have to understand that even a guy, Alan Stern, who, who is, uh, you know, he, he's, a, 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 he's of the Jewish uh, ethnicity, and he was fully aware of this, and, he, and his view on point on this question it's time we take back what's been, uh, t uh, uh, you know, um, co-opted by people who have very uh, poor ideas of humanity. So that wasn't the reason why it was chosen. But when this came up, you know, we had to sort of make clear, uh, you know, we had to, to point people out the fact that this is not a, not a bad thing. So, uh, but it's meant to represent the pushing of the boundaries, going to the, where we've not gone before. And Kathy uh, went and looked it up in the Oxford Dictionary and that discovered that it means a distant, unknown region, the extreme limit of travel and discovery. That's so right. This is the, so, so, and, and, and it originated from uh, these, it came from the Romans themselves uh, in terms of their, you know, uh, track of their expeditions out to the furthest northern reaches and so on. So yeah, it's that, that type of uh, merging with that. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop talking. So we have a couple of uh, questions here. We have one from Richard about, uh, he notes that there's a bright ring between Ultima and Thule. And so are there any thoughts about yeah. the bright ring? So let me, let me get to that. That's a segue into the next, uh, <laughs> uh, my, my next slide. So uh, yeah, so uh, let me, uh, I, some of you probably already read what uh, I have uh, over here. Um, yes, so uh, so at some point when we uh, decided that, uh, well, it's obviously it's two bodies and we we're gonna call it Ultima Thule, so we decided to call the small guy Thule and the other one Ultima, right? Ultimate, right? I don't know, it's kind of silly. But I was there at the moment where uh, Jeff Moore, who is the head of the uh, geology and geophysics imaging team, he just made this blanket declaration. That shall be Ultima and that shall be Thule. So we all had a good laugh, of course, because it made perfect sense. <laughs> so the, here, here are these, uh, the two bodies and uh, one slightly larger than the other. You can see the dimensions given to you and these are the di di diameter, di the radial dimensions. Yes, Ultima Thule has this bright collar. Um, its albedo is about 50% larger than the albedo of the rest of the body. What is it? Why is it there? What is it telling us? We do not know. Uh, we've come up with lots of ideas, and I'll say a few words about what might be, but uh, right at the current stage, we have no idea as to why this is there, 
is this, I mean, we have ideas, but we, there's no way to select between the various ideas. And I'll say a few words about that down the line. But there are other regions that also have these uh, bright white, uh, brighter uh, albedo reflecting pattern as well. Uh, the typical albedo of this body, though, on average, is about 0.06, so it's pretty dark, darker than Charon. Has a high obliquity, which is, uh, was a mystery um, in terms of why is this body not showing a light curve? As we were approaching it, it didn't show very much light variations, and that's because its obliquity is almost 90 degrees, on like 99 degrees, so it was showing very little variation as we were coming because it was basically spinning like a propeller and approaching it, which is kind of freakish. You're like, why, why is this? And it has this strong, it has this very strong inclination, almost like the in inclination of Uranus. Uh, not, there's not, I'm not saying that they're connected, but I'm just saying that, that it has that kind of uh, qualitative similarity. Uh, let's see, 15.9 uh, hour rotation period. Uh, that would, had been a question of the debate for quite a while. We didn't know what it was, but it wasn't only until about uh, about 12 hours before closest approach we finally were able to to assess that it was that we thought it could be 15.9, or it could have been twice that, or it could have been twice that, because we we couldn't quite tell based on the way that the light curve was showing us what was the actual uh, 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 frequency of the uh, of, of, of what we were seeing. We had to actually see it for ourselves to see it spinning, to be able to actually select it. Now this is a, a picture of, on the left, this is a beautiful one. You see the image as we are approaching it. On the left is the actual images, but blown up to on the same scale, but kind of giving us the sense of what it was doing as we were approaching it. On the right is the actual image. Uh, we derotated it uh, just to kind of give you a, uh, what it was looking like, just to give you a sense of like how it was probably spinning in the rotator in the rotating frame of the body itself. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, that took a lot of work to uh, get that right, and then this we can tell we can actually construct something about its uh, um, about its shape on the backside. I'll talk a little bit about that. Oh my goodness, I'm running out of time. All right, so this is another view of Ultima Thule. It's kind of dancing around. This is what a stereoscopic view. Um, I, I have actually one where you can do the two images, but I didn't include that in this slide. I'm sorry, that's, that was my fail. Kind of give you a sense of scale of Ultima Thule compared to our, our home, our, our local zone. <laughs> uh, this is what the Ultima Thule looks like. Uh, by comparison to um, uh, bot the structures that we see on, on, uh, on Pluto, kind of gives you a sense of also, even though we were four times as close, uh, we're still looking at a it's basically NAS, it says here, my internet connection is unstable. Uh, because NASA said that it was too risky to fly closer than what we actually did. Uh, this is a picture of the backside as the ball across the sky, which is kind of cool. This was important because we use this coupled with uh, the uh, radio information to extract its temperatures, uh, what the temperature of the body is like. Okay, next page. Um, here is a quick model view of the uh, what we think the body looks like, and it's, uh, and you. That Tule is more spherical, Ultima is a more flattened ball. I think we're going through a little bit of an unstable point here. Okay, you might want to move on to the next slide because it could be that video that's causing it. Hope we didn't lose them all together.
when this happens to me, I discover that I've been uh, talking and without realizing no one was hearing. Uh, it looks like we lost him. Um, I'm sure. Well, he's well, he may come back. Yeah. You know, he might have uh, bumped out and he might come back in. <laughs> we can get all the way to the edges of our solar system. <laughs> oh, but we can't talk to each other across the country. So it's. <laughs> Well, there are a hundred and some of us on here tonight, so. There are. Well, it's also been an exciting time just in the general East Bay area with like connectivity and electricity, and there's a refinery fire up the street, so. Oh, that's right. Yep. But um, hopefully back in a second. Um, I actually had a, since you brought up the expanse, I was actually wondering about the, uh, like how tight, I heard the, how tightly packed uh, Ultima, uh, Thule is like is a rubble correct it seems like it's more of a rubble pile so say if you're on the expanse universe they like to spin up their asteroids to generate artificial gravity and it would just like uh, fly apart but uh I can't ask him right now <laughs> <laughs> well we're almost at the top of the hour again anyway got about yep. four minutes left yeah, um, we had a question about getting the slides from the presentation and Orkun said that he was uh, willing to share the slides. So when we get those, we will definitely put them on the resource page as well. So that'll probably be the next several days. Hey! Hey, he's back. I'm back. <laughs> Yay. I'm sorry, and I think I've run out of time, haven't I? Well, we're pretty much, uh, you know, if you want to take a couple minutes to kind of wrap up here, I think that, yeah, that would be... Yeah, I can show uh, you three good. slides to kind of Perfect. wrap things up. Perfect. And, then, and uh, here, let's uh, share. And, uh oh there it is. Okay. Let's share this page. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> thank you for... Uh, I just wanted to just to point out what beautiful about this this was those measurements i was telling you the ground campaign measurements and we knew that it looked like this when I mean, we take the actual object and we put it and this is the actual object wet of the actual objects based on the images and it fit perfectly on what those ground uh trans uh ground campaign measurements had predicted it to be which is beautiful because when we finally figure that out we're like oh my god we're, we're we're not out of our minds and the the, the folks that were involved with that are the fella here you see on the right, that's Mark Buey, and uh, Simon Porter helped him very much in this sort of thing, and it was uh, in the effort, so it was pretty cool. And then, so there's Mark Buey. I, I just think it's so amazing that he did this. And then John Spencer is the mission, uh, he designed the mission, so they worked closely together to make, uh, to, to, to make sure that this thing worked, so it was kind of cool. Like, wow, it totally worked out. All right, so a couple quick things. Um, we don't really understand the geology. Uh, there's a, a lot of cool things that we think we see. Um, on the right is a geologic map of the surface, but that's just what it is. It's a map based on textual analysis, but we don't know what anything is really made of. Uh, we have some, a lot of ideas, and I will make these slides available for people if they want to see them. Um, we have certain notions that locations up here may be examples of what's called scarp retreat having to do uh, with the uh, uh, sublimation of certain um, uh, relatively volatile species over the lifetime of the solar system or may happen very early on as well we don't know uh, this is a cool one I really wanted to show you this I, if I had a full hour I would do it if I wasn't talking so much but the, this is cool this shows you what the geopotentials look like the arrows show you where if you were to place a ball on the surface and what direction it would flow we also have discovered that the two lobes are very aligned with each other. So their spinning axes, their dominant spinning axes are aligned with one another. How did that happen? We're not really quite sure. Uh, we have some confirmation. I'll skip over this. I wanted to show you this is a spectrum. And what the spectrum shows is a predominant. Oh, I think we lost you again.
Well, we did have a question about what the uh, URL for the outreach resource page is. Um, and I think Dave was going to pull that up and post it. Generally, if you were able to uh, find the uh, link for pre registering for this, it uh, should be on the same page. And that's where we'll be posting the video as well as posting the slides. So I think that, um, you know, there's a a lot of really uh, interesting questions. And, and I think that uh, there are a lot of questions about the dynamics of the collision between the two bodies that I would have found quite interesting, but I think we're gonna have to save that for another time. So I think that um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording now. And so thank you, everybody. Stick, stick around, we'll be right back here. <laughs>